Welcome back. It is my great pleasure to introduce Simone Farasin, co-founder of the research-based design studio Forma Fantasma. Through engagement with materials like wood, leather, and lava, Forma Fantasma investigates topics from the ore streams of recycling electronic waste to the philosophy and politics of trees. Forma Fantasma engages design to question the way we live and to analyze the ecological, historical, political, and social forces that shape the discipline of design. Using natural materials to heal our broken relationship with nature and objects to repair our broken relationship with things, Forma Fantasma explores the ghosts in our forms and our possibilities for formative change, offering us a view of design as radical, liberatory, and transformative. Forma Phantasma has recently launched the GeoDesign Master's Program at Design Academy Eindhoven. They've exhibited at the Venice Biennale, Amsterdam's Rijk Museum, and the Serpentine Galleries in London. And they've also just been named Wallpaper Magazine's Designer of the Year, among many other honors. I am delighted to welcome Simone Farasin to the Herboretum Symposium to speak to us about bringing global ecological concerns into design practice. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for having me. Um, so before uh, sharing uh, my screen, I would like for us to give an introduction of the way I will frame today's presentation. As it was previously described, my name is uh, Simone Farazin, and together with my partner, Andretti Manki, we are heading a design studio in Amsterdam. And it is from the design perspective that I'm looking at the subject of centers and peripheries, which I took the freedom to interpret quite broadly. Um, today, I will mainly focus on a recent research that was formalized in its first installment as an exhibition at Serpentine Galleries in London that focus on the governance of the timber industry. The exhibition is called Cambio, and through the lens of timber extraction, looks into the infrastructure that design inevitably ends up supporting when delivering objects, buildings, and of course, even services. But before to go into that, I would like to spend two words on the design discipline and the struggle that design has in um, facing real ecological uh, development and thinking. In fact, while the act of design can be defined as the propensity of humans to conceive and construct desired changes in their environment, design as a discipline formed in conjunction with industrial revolution. And design has based its development on essentially one big narrative, the idea of human well-being and the concept of needs. In fact, when it's best, design has proved to be a valuable tool for the improvement of the life of citizens. While at its worst, product development has been undertaken based on a market conception of the needs of citizens, very often transformed in consumers, as endless as the energetic resources availability. In this sense, the anthropocentric dimension of design is not only intrinsic, but also historically conceived by the discipline of design itself. The complex organization of the world depends on human needs, and therefore all other beings and objects on planet Earth are subordinated to human will. But obviously, anthropocentric and user-centered principles find troubles addressing the challenges that a sustainable future entails, since they are in conflict with the basic conception of the life on the planet as the cohabitation of multiple species. And it is from these premises, actually, that design expanded its focus and evolved, at least in the action most avant-garde and ethically responsible education, into socially engaged discipline. In fact, I think it is interesting to mention how, until a few years ago, in the uh, Design Academy, where uh, me and I have been involved since years, and now we are heading to the geodesign department, 
is an economy in nine domain. The, uh, despite dropping the product center subdivisions of the uh, different departments, still the human was placed at the center as the ultimate and only referent of design. The department, the department were called men and well-being, men and humanity, men and mobility, and so, and so on. Despite, it might sound almost paradoxical, consider the very human-centered nature of design. To develop a less anthropocentric and more complex narrative is the most sensible way to embrace the real ecological thinking beyond sustainability, which we all know is becoming a more tired and oversimplified concept. Obviously, here the suggestion is not to remove the human at the center of the design debate, but rather to identify a more inclusive and holistic focus. And it is from these premises that over the course of almost two years, we developed the content that was formalized in the exhibition Cambio that I mentioned before. The body of work we presented there in March 2020 acknowledges the legacy of industrial production as the fundamental source for the expertise and agency of the designer in contemporary society. But at the same time, it addressed the historic contribution of the designer's role to environmental and social instability and its incompatibility with models of sustainable or even survivable futures. The exhibition, as I mentioned before, does so by taking a subject of research and reflection, the timber industry. What we can call an hyper object because of its scale and evolution over time and space, it's difficult, if not impossible to describe, understand, or even regulate. Despite this, we still think it is interesting the attempt to, to map this, uh, this object. And we know that taking such a diverse and expansive subject risks generalization. Nevertheless, we firmly believe in the necessity to read and understand design when it's larger context. One that includes extraction, refinement, production, distribution, and the afterlife of things and material. These, in fact, are those peripheral territories that design discipline often ignores. But if we believe it is a true form of design, we are going to shape the way we live on the planet. Possibly, actually, we believe not um, based on dichotomies, for instance, between centers and peripheries. We need in first place to recognize design on limitation in those liminal areas design ignored. The decision to focus on the governance of the timber industry was led actually by a variety of different also personal interests. But it was also the consequence of the exhibition's uh, location. And now I would like to share the screen. I hope you can all see my, my screen now. So um, I was saying um, that the location of the uh, exhibition where we formalize our investigation into timber is Serpentine Galleries in, uh, in London that is based in Kensington Gardens, part of Hyde Park and not far from where in May, 1851, the great exhibition on the works of industry of all nations was inaugurated by Queen Victoria Prince Albert, and of course, his artistic director, Henry Cole. The reason why I'm mentioning this exhibition is, of course, because it led somehow the content of the show uh, or inspired the, the, the subject of the show, I would say. But it is also uh, because the great exhibition had a tremendous impact in the development of architecture and design. And the great exhibition was conceived as a celebration of the achievement of industrial production and was housed in the Crystal Palace, designed by Joseph Paxton, as an immense glass structure, a groundbreaking feat of engineering reflecting a modern architectural ideology of terraforming. As a horticulturist himself, Paxton was occupied by creation of artificial environments to shelter exotic plants imported by European traders and scientists from colonized territories. But with a great exhibition and a crystal palace, the center shift from the vegetal realm to the human subject. While Paxton's impressive architecture of glass and steel has been very often praised for in its engineering qualities, it is on a semantic level that we find it impressive. 
The architectural typology of the greenhouse once conceived for the survival of vegetal species in alien territories is here reconceptualized as a vitrine to glorify the infinite possibilities of industrial machineries, while at the same time exhibiting materials extracted from colonized territories. Plants and trees are not any more subjects of the architecture, but rather objects either in the form of vegetal decorations or exotic material samples to be appropriated by producers and cabinet makers. But the influence of the Great Exhibition on the development of the design discipline extends further. Part of the profits generated by the selling of tickets of the Great Exhibition were deployed to fund the Victoria Numbered Museum, where many of the artifacts presented at Crystal Palace found a permanent exhibition venue in the form of a study collection as a form of inspiration for designers. In a similar attempt to emphasize the relevance of industrial development, Henry Cole was also appointed General Superintendent of the Department of Practical Art. It was a position created ad hoc to reform the art schools of the kingdom in the light of the new conceptual of art as linked much more to industrial development. In this sense, the vital interconnection between imperial expansion, resources exploitation, and industrial development could not be, I guess, clearer. Cambio symbolically departs from some of the wood samples exhibited in 1851, now part of the Economic Botany Collection at Kew Gardens, and recentered the attention to the trees, at least on a symbolic level, that were mar marginalized and reduced to decorative items. The title Cambio referenced the membrane that runs around the trunk of trees, the function of which is to produce wood on the inside and bark on the outside. The vascular cambium also plays a fundamental role in helping plants and trees to adapt to climate instabilities and thus to transform themselves. When a tree is felled for the production of timber, branches are removed, roots are removed, and of course the bark too. The cambia layer in that moment, it is gone. This is the moment in which a living species is becoming a product. And this, as you can see from the slide, was basically the opening um, element of the exhibition. But the word cambio in Italian means also change, and the show is named after it precisely because of the polysemic nature of this. We hope, in fact, that the exhibition could participate in shifting the common perception of design as a tool for styling to an approach that can affect real transformation in the time of climate and social instabilities. The development of a holistic and inclusive perspective is, we believe, the only way to take design discipline forward to more responsible critical levels of engagement. In Cambio, the inclusion of works and voices of practitioners never or rarely considered as part of the design conversation is a way to recognize design and production as part of a complex ecosystem, not separated from the natural ecosystem. Both of which can be transformed for the better only with the convergence of different knowledges and approaches. It is a method of simultaneously enriching design culture and making this simply more inclusive or narratives that have been open overlooked. The exhibition, in fact, is a collaborative effort that includes the works of, and contributions of experts from the field of science, conservation, engineering, policy making, and philosophy. Together, they move from microscopic analysis of wood and its ability to store carbon dioxide to a metaphysical understanding of trees as living organisms. I will now briefly show some of the interventions in the exhibition just to uh, give you an idea of the content of the of the of the show uh, i will not go uh, in in depth in into it and of course i would like also to remind you that the actually the investigation cambio um is continuing in other in other forms uh, and of course it was finalized uh, in this way and with specific content that we know it could work in the format of uh, an exhibition so the first section of the show presents forensic research undertaken in collaboration with a number of different scientific institutions 
into the data that can be found in wood. The analysis of these mundane objects, many of which are still produced from protected species, can help to regulate logging practices around the world and offer manufacturers, designers, and users better information about the impact of their material choices. Um, the, the installation was based on a collection of objects that we source in, within the European Union and through the help of the Tuning Institute in Hamburg, we uh, forensic analyzed the materials in order to understand really the, the specimens contained in, the, in it. But I will not, as I said, go in, in details into this because I prefer to focus on a related uh, installation. Um, and in this more precise example, uh, uh, it is a, a work for the future as a, a section uh, in the installation that's called On the Origin of the Species and it's developing conversation as I said with the Tuning Institute. It is an attempt to map the species of wood using books printed globally. We source selection of different copies of Darwin's On the Origin of the Species printed in a number of different countries. Paper from each book was microscopically analyzed uh, by the Tuning Institute in the attempt to identify the relationship between the location of the printer and the origin of the species used in the paper. The results revealed there, there to be a little, if no relationship at all, between the geographical side of the printer and the ecosystem that provided the wood for the paper they are using. Although most paper are made of a mixture of different palms, often from different places and species, the most common were pine and eucalyptus. Fast growing wood species used for the production of pulp and paper can now be found widely distributed in the globe, regardless of where they grew originally. Given the rapidly rising demand for paper and other paper products, the increase of fast growing plantation is likely to continue to replace endemic ecosystem. A good example in this, in this sense is a copy of uh, the book printed in Brazil on paper made uh, also entirely from eucalyptus. Its natural distribution covers Australia and Malaysia, but with countries like Brazil now exporting large amounts of pulp, this fast growing tree has replaced species native from South America. Paper production is just one part of the timber industry where efficiency and productivity is favored over diversity. The exhibition continues with a combination of images, texts, films, and objects, exploring the contemporary use of colonial wood-based archives, such as the Economic Botany Collection. In this sense, the, the samples that you see uh, in the images are the ones, a, a part of the one that were exhibited in the uh, Great Exhibition of the 51. Today, the purely economic function of the archive has been superseded by new conservation-led principles. Samples from these woods are used to provide comparative data against which products like books previously described can be tested to prevent the consumption and distribution of logged wood. Of, of course, here it is somehow interesting to note how the countries that are in charge uh, of regulating, I would say, or analyzing and understanding the trading of illegal timber are the same that, and, and, the, and the only one that, um, of course, had a, a colonial past. I have to say that in this sense, European Union is in any case doing quite a decent job in um, not imposing regulation upon uh, exporting, exporting countries. Nevertheless, there is still an obvious uh, power um, Unbalance here. This section of the show also explores contemporary material collections, such as the virtual wood library offered by popular 3D rendering software Kisha, which is a tool that is often used by designers to render objects or interiors or architecture, which includes the rare and endangered woods as available for designers to apply to the surface of their forms. Digital tools such as this can be used to simulate finished objects and without a critical intervention into context of sustainability, appear to perpetuate the myth of endless supply of materials. The show feature also two films in the form of visual essays that works as a central body of knowledge around which gravitates the other intervention. One 
which is also called cambio, starts with the appearance of uh, primordial plants on Earth, their evolution into trees, and the subsequent flourishing of human life across the planet. It continues with the global expansion of timber industry in conjunction with European imperialist agenda, and its later shift towards the development of sustainable forestry practices and environmental conservation. The film is shot in a former Italian plantation for paper production, and it makes use of coma K compositing. Here, the forest is never just a background. It is the subject matter and the focus of the movie. The other film, Seeing the Wood for the Trees, is developed with the scientific support of activist Vanessa Richardson of the London-based NGO European Investigation Agency. The video focuses on the governance of the timber industry and how it is structured today, touching upon the major European global regulations and reg regulatory bodies involved in it. The exhibition concludes with a view of forestry that moves beyond the extraction of resources and attempts to understand the complex ecosystem that forested regions contain. It does so by bringing together approaches to the governance and management of both European and Amazonian forests and compares changes in these approaches over time and from different geopolitical and cultural perspectives. Closing the show is a film produced by manipulating a LiDAR scan of an oak forest in Virginia. LiDAR is a technology which comes from the terms light detection and ranging, uses lasers to scan and records large surfaces areas and has often been used in contemporary uh, cartography and archeology. span More recently, it has been adopted by the timber industry in order to selectively log trees. Like uh, the Radan maps, that uh, we show an installation uh, close by. Here, uh, the, um, the technology has been uh, recontextualized and provides an opportunity to consider humans from the point of view of trees, with a voiceover written by philosopher and botanist Emanuele Cocha, which is one of the, of the speakers of this symposium. The attempt basically here is, in a way, really to use a very naive technique, which is involving the anthropomorphizing actually of trees, but to use it as a as a as a way of um, establishing, I would say, empathy with other than human species. Kocha's text questions our own sense of dominance as humans, observing rather the degree up to which humanity is dependent upon the form and physicality of trees from the perspective of an imagined forest. It suggests a crucial shift in perspective. If we are to find more radical ways of living with and protecting these complex ecosystems, one that stems from the understanding that humans and trees are obviously interlinked. I would like to now stop the sharing and uh, still continue the presentation. The transdisciplinary approach of Cambio is not only a way to increase the scale and depth of the research, but it is also an ethical position to respect, or at least it tries to do so, the expertise, the skill, and the lived experience of individuals and institutions in other fields and in other cultures. These interrelations ask designers to address responsibility, politics, and other issues arising from design complicity across multiple industries, communication networks, and aesthetics. The aim here is in first place to better understand the level of complexity we are all working and living in, while at the same time offering clear reflections and design questions. How can the practices of observation and care towards plants turn into their life, features, behaviors, and necessities, shed light on our ecological and entangled lives? What can we learn about climate change by analyzing the anatomical features of trees? How would wood production change if we would take into consideration their ability of sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere? How can we as designers make more informed choices when deciding to select a wood-based material over another beyond its aesthetic and functional properties? And perhaps most importantly, how can the imagination and elastic approach of design be helpful in translating today's emerging environmental awareness and scientific knowledge into informed collaborative responses. 
we believe the designer can be a critical agent in a global system, but their skill set and perspective must expand rapidly beyond isolated self-referential processes of artistic making and subjective intuition. Keep in mind, we still extremely value that. Design must be radically rooted in an expansive understanding of reality, but a reality that acknowledges how real world problems are easily reduced to briefs for well-founded design solutions with an educable benefit to their intended users. Education, in this sense, is probably one of the few contexts where this more radical approach to design can be investigated and where the fragile but crucially important new narrative can be fostered. Thank you. I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. And I, I already feel the great value in this wider discussion that we're having because there are threads and pieces that connected um, to Leslie Green's talk earlier. Um, so that's really exciting. But first, before I um, respond and, and ask you a question, I want to invite everyone, please use the question and answer um, feature and ask questions because we really want to, to hear from you. As you were talking, I had a really um, powerful memory of having done field work a long time ago in Bolivia. And my field work ha had only to do with health. It, you know, it wasn't about trees, it had nothing to do with trees, but th there came a time um, in the year I was there that people were burning great swaths of the forest for agriculture. And it was just raining, raining soot and raining these pieces of um, burned trees and and then people are breathing it in and so I was thinking yes it's really interesting that we are all implicated um, in the timber industry in in both its production and its the absence and Absolutely. yeah that that was a moment of real awakening for me and so I'm curious um, you are decentering design in such an interesting way to to really connect it to other fields and i'm interesting interested in how do you work with um your students to to do that like as people come in to work with you what's one thing that you have to that you wish that they would unlearn that's a very very an extremely very good question you have to know that the geo design department started uh, in September. So we are at the very early stages. And of course, we don't have the, um, we don't have the intent of structuring it as a necessarily as a sort of top-down system of education. So this process of our learning about design, it's a collective conversation that we are having with the students. What is interesting to see is that we see a generation of, um, of designers that comes within education with a completely different understanding of design as a discipline and with an awareness of how easily the discipline can be complicit in systems of exploitation or or um, capital accumulation it is an extremely different uh, difficult debate we are having because of course it is about rethinking partially the discipline as you said as, you know as you said before it is about decentering it and I have to say it is a constant uh, dialogue and, and debate on how to do so. The, the, it's impossible, I would say, to, um, to, to establish even the education in a, in a fixed form because there is a constant revision of it. But for instance, one way we are trying to do so, for instance, is thanks also to the uh, help of Meredith, one of the organizers of today's symposium, that will be part, for instance, um, in the third trimester of a collaborative uh, project where Meredith will lead the student, so design student, in conversation with uh, an architect. So it is about really trying to um, create a hybrid conversations between different disciplines and see how designers can respond to that. In specifically, for instance, in that trimester, they will look into how design and if design can design for other than human species. We are inevitably already doing that. 
but I guess design sort of very often, of course, there is also several sophisticated versions of design, but in the common understanding, never engage in, in, um, in thinking about the needs of pathogen human species, which is basically what you know the world uh, interventions of today was trying to, to express. There is, a, you know, design will shape and it is shaping the world we live in, the material world we live in, but we need to rethink, if not even use this other word, decolonize design before to move forward, which is extremely challenging um, um, endeavor. I love that response. And what, it, what I was picturing as you were speaking is, is that maybe part of this is that as we begin to collaborate among disciplines, we pull each discipline a little bit off center. So we begin to, to uh, encompass together a, a wider field of, of inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll turn to a question that we've received that says, uh, thank you for the wonderful insights. How do you think cognitive bias relates to design being anthropocentric and blocking empathy with other species? How can the conversation and research become actionable? Yeah, very, very good question. Very good question, especially the second part of the question, which, which is about, you know, how can we put this in practice? How can we activate uh, these conversations? Um, regarding the second part of the questions, I would say that uh, there's, there are different ways. And uh, the, for instance, the, content of the exhibition that I've been describing, which is of course in its scope, it was much more extensive. It is uh, for us a way to um, not only have sort of open a public debate, but it's also to show how uh, this kind of thinking could possibly be applied, for instance, also within uh, uh, companies that produce wood-based products, for instance. So in this moment, we are internalizing this approach to a um, company that is producing furniture in wood. And we are trying to re-establish, or at least this is you know, our attempt, uh, a link with the forest. It's, it might seem banal, but because knowledge and not only knowledge is often compartmentalized, the producers often are detached from the biome they refer to for, for the production of their own goods. So our attempt with this collaboration is, which is just started, is to relink it back and to see, to look in which way design can intervene, not only in the level of the product, but on the level of, um, for instance, material sourcing or establishing uh, even conversation with um, the, the companies we're working with and uh, forestry practices. Um, it is, a, a, of course, an extremely complex um, dialogue because, of course, there are economic interests. And uh, there is, um, of course, on the other side, the necessity of a biome. And uh, there will always be compromises. But I think design can work in finding more, um, in healing at least the broken relationship between the biome and the productive center. Um, and regarding the first part of the question, uh, I need to read it again. Um, how do you think cognitive bias relates to design being of blocking empathy with other species? Well, um, I don't think necessarily it, it is blocking uh, empathy with other species. I simply think other species were not part of the conversation. So uh, it is as simple as, as that. Humans are the center of the conversation. And, and I have to say, uh, in the most avant-garde understanding of design, where design is seen as a service of the improvement of the life of citizens. Nevertheless, it is often seen as a tool for styling. And so the delivering of um, a solution for desires, not really necessities. Of course, we can debate you know, the, how uh, much a desire is also a necessity, but nevertheless, I think it is the process of shifting the focus that will change uh, the design perspective. And of course, that's not necessarily easy. Um, and again, it is not about removing the human at the center, but sort of 
understanding how the human is related to other entangled um, other entanglements. Um, it is extremely challenging for what I said before, because design sits in this complex spot that is in between the sources of production, the transformation of uh, materials into services, building and objects, um, shaping and participating in shaping of culture. And of course, it is because of this reason that we think design is an extremely relevant uh, discipline that needs to understand these implications before moving forward, I would say. I really love this idea of design as being at this nexus, this crossroads of many things coming together, which makes it very complicated, but also potentially so powerful. So I'm sad to say we're out of time. This has been uh, just wonderful. And thank you so much. I can say I feel um, inspired and excited and feel that this sense of, um, of hope that we can redesign things. Yeah, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.